exciting and um, good evening, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for those who are here in person and also for those who are watching us live streaming. I will ask the board secretary to take a role to establish a quorum for the record. Letitia? Yes, thank you. Member Benitez? Right on cue, present. <laughs> President Craighead? Present. Member Lopez? Present. Member Miller? Here. And Member Otto? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Letitia. Um, and now we will have the pledge um, with <clears throat> Celeste Ignacio from Poly. Welcome, Celeste. Please stand. Ready, begin. Thank you, Celeste. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms here by where the board secretary is sitting. And that's Letitia over there, our board secretary. If you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form now indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. I had a last minute script uh, change, so I'm just making sure I do everything in order. <laughs> So the board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda. And the board took action on the following items. On item 3.1, confidential student matters, pursuant to California Education Code 35146, the board took a number of actions. And usually, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just gonna make a note of this because we, we're doing things differently tonight. Um, over the course of the last uh, year and a half or so, two years, we've been upgrading our process and what we've been doing. And usually we take this vote under the superintendent items, but it was a duplication of a vote. We vote in closed session and then we'd come in open session here and vote. So tonight I'm gonna report on the vote we took in closed session as opposed to having a second vote here uh, in the public meeting. So first the board voted 5-0 to lift the expulsion of two students, student ID numbers 9169 and 3108, and assign them to a school or instructional program as recommended by the Office of Student Placement Services. Additionally, the board voted 5-0 to expel five students, Two students, ID numbers 2194 and 5764, were expelled pursuant to Education Code Section 48900M with the recommendation that the student be or students be considered for a suspended expulsion with an opportunity to attend another school within the district. Student ID number 7286 was expelled pursuant to Education Code Sections 48900M and 48900.7. Student ID number 4189 was expelled pursuant to Education Code Section 48900.7. Student ID number 8120 was expelled pursuant to Education Code Section 48900M. All five of these students will not be eligible to apply for readmission until after June 15, 2023. Regarding item 3.2, public employee release, the board voted 5-0 to approve two retirement agreement releases with permanent certificated teachers resolving all claims between the parties and providing for consideration. Okay, uh, we will now adopt the agenda. 
Are there any changes to the agenda requested by a board member? Um, if not, is there a motion to adopt the agenda as posted? I move to approve. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes 5-0. Next item on the agenda is 11.1. .1. This is the time for the public hearing regarded amended bargaining proposals from the California School Employees Association Chapter 2, Unit A and Unit B to the Long Beach Unified School District. The hearing is now open. Are there any public comments? Okay, so I, sorry? Did I? I, no, not yet. I'm, I'm on number eight and you're talking about number nine. Okay, so so um, we have no one who's, who wants to speak on the um, public hearing, so I will now declare that hearing closed. And now I'd like to introduce our uh, student board member for the evening, Celeste Ignacio. Actually, Madam Chair. No, okay. I believe that Mr. Otto was Darn correct. <gasps> If you, we can proceed as you mapped it out, but um, we skipped over, you went to a public hearing and we skipped oh, over. I. Yes. I'm sorry, I that, okay. So you know what, I'm dealing with as, too many. As you feel. Well, since I already did okay. it, <laughs> yeah. it's done. <laughs> so my apologies for getting ahead on the, you see I'm just, uh, you know, trying to move the meeting along. I accept that. Uh, Just don't forget to come yeah. back to Just, the Right, comments. right. So we will go out of order, since I already did the public hearing, and um, we will go back to introduction of our student board member, and both of you on either side will keep me on track, or at least put me back on track once I'm off. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Celeste Ignacio, current ASB president at Long Beach Poly High School. I am so very honored to be here today to tell you about all the wonderful things that have been happening at Poly. This past fall semester, ASB put together several events such as the Sadie Hawkins Dance, Homecoming Fair, Blood Drive, Holiday Project, and our annual Jackrabbit Pageant. In October, our Sadie Hawkins event hosted over 1,000 Poly students. The following week, we had over 70 clubs participate in our homecoming fair, a school-wide carnival-like event where our campus comes together to show our school pride and spirit. In December, our Commissioner of Welfare, Ariana Lopez, organized a very successful blood drive, receiving 125 pints of blood donated by our campus community. Also in December, our Commissioner of Outreach, Kira Lamb, put on a wonderful holiday project. Through our holiday project, we invite the children from our local communities to have a fun-filled day with activities such as cookie decorating, holiday arts and crafts, a Santa meet and greet, and lastly, they receive a special gift. This last month, we held our 20th annual Jackrabbit Pageant, a talent show that showcases our wonderful seniors. Head coordinators Joseph Bass, Timothy Wynn, and myself were able to pull off an amazing show with 11 contestants. Winners Bradley Diggs, and Natalie Guevara captured the hearts of the judges with their fantastic singing. Our fall sports program did amazing representing the homeless scholars and champions as our varsity football team took more league and represented us in the Division I CIF playoffs. Our girls flag football team made history as they became the first girls flag football team to represent Long Beach and even made it to the championship game of the inaugural season. Our cross country team did amazing with both our boys and girls team winning more league and sending many athletes to the CIF state championship. Our girl cross country coach, Gabrielle <coughs> Borns, was named coach of the year by Long Beach Press Telegram. This week, ASB has big thing, things on our agenda, such as our spring sports signing day event and our winter formal. Our co-commissioners of athletics, Annette Guzman and Zara Zaid, Zara Zaid, have about 13 student athletes committing early to colleges across the country. In addition, this Saturday is our annual winter formal dance hosted by our junior senate. The theme is the Grand Masquerade. 
Our Senate is working very hard to put on an amazing dance for our students. We are also very excited to host our Poly Site Night on Tuesday, February 7th from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at our campus. This is our opportunity to share the great things going on with our Pathway programs and hopefully get some new Jackrabbits to join us for the upcoming school year. Later this spring semester, we will be having our 40th year of our Poly North program. For those who have not heard of Poly North, it is our Humans Relation Camp in Big Bear Lake where sophomores are able to connect with each other through the help of senior counselors and staff. Within the camp, cr groups discuss the importance of difficult issues. This allows students to interact with new people, breaking down the barriers of high school misconceptions. In May, we will be hosting our Barnes & Noble Book Fair at the Long Beach Town Center location, where our ASB will host a fundraiser, a craft corner, and an open mic area. In March, ASB will be hosting our annual intercultural fair with our Commission of Organizations, Timothy Wynn, very similar to the homecoming fair, but instead of showing our school pride and spirit, we will be honoring each other's different cultures with food, drinks, and performances. Also in March, our spring musical will be taking place. This year's show will be Chicago Teen Edition. Our Garden Club and the Special Education Department are organizing their second annual Festival of Gardening and Butterflies, where we celebrate our beautiful environment. There will be different tables with, with items such as succulents, indoor plants, cactus table, art and crafts, and more. All the items given are donated and free for all students that come to the festival. The festival will take place at the end of Wellness Week, organized by our Meds Pathway and Kamai Girls in Action. Our student body has a lot to look forward to for this new spring semester. Thank you for letting me share a few of our poly highlights with you all. Thank you again for having me and for always supporting our students. Go Jackrabbits! And so did you mention if you were a senior? I did not, but I am. <laughs> oh, okay. And so you have plans for uh, next year? Yes. Um, I just found out that I am going to San Diego State University. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Fabulous. And what is your area of study? Uh, speech pathology. Oh. Very, <laughs> very, <laughs> that's, that's very popular in this group. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I. With the theme for this evening's meeting, we're getting ahead of ourselves, and Mr. Zaid would like you to know there's a recruitment <laughs> fair next week. So, um, oh, I yeah. will. So I'm going to have you stay. Usually, this is the time where I tell the student you, you may um, go. I know you have homework, and it's a school night and everything. But we have a special presentation tonight because tonight we are introducing our five finalists for the uh, Student Board of ed ed Education uh, member. And so what we have been doing is rotating students from different schools, but Dr. Baker and I went through a process of interviewing five finalists, and so we're going to be introducing those finalists tonight. So we'd like you to stay for that, um, if you wouldn't mind. So Dr. Baker? Yes, well I am so excited to introduce our finalists. There were more than 20 applicants for the position of student board member. And so starting in March, in addition to a visiting board member like Celeste, we will also have a seated board member. This is a process, the board approved a policy around it, and a student board member will sit up with you for the entire meeting and go through the process of learning about civic engagement, voting on items um, and using all of the materials that board members have publicly available to them to bring student voice to the role of a board member. And so each of the five tonight who are finalists are going to introduce themselves and their school and also just share with you from the microphone why they applied to be a student board member. And so first of all, let's just give them all a round of applause all here. And I'd like to call Lily up to the microphone first. Good evening. My name is Lily Lycom. I'm a senior and I attend Lakewood High School. Um, I heard about the student board member position from my activities director, Mr. Booth. He had shared this opportunity to me shortly after my meeting in November. 
where I felt very safe, welcome, and respected by all of the board members. So essentially, without hesitation, I applied at the prospect of being um, Long Beach Unified School District's first student board member. I applied to this position because I truly care about my school community. I wish to be part of the solution by addressing issues that are preventing us from reaching our full potential, as well as so that future generations of LBUSD students will continue to thrive. I believe I possess the qualities to advocate for my peers and underrepresented individuals because I am an action-driven individual. In other words, I am simply incapable of observing issues and complaining about them without offering or being part of a solution. Having the opportunity of using this platform would allow me to use my preferential vote to speak for the voices of my district, not just my own. Lastly, I would love to learn more about district governance and the impact decision making has on the student experience as a whole, which is evidently tied to my AP research paper. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Each of the students that you're meeting tonight, not only did they do an application that involved a writing opportunity for them to answer a set of questions, they came in for an in-person interview with Mrs. Craighead and me um, and presented themselves in that way. For some of them, it was their very first interview. So a great experience for us to welcome them into a, an aspect of adulting um, to be a part of the Board of Education. So I'd like to welcome Sasha next. Hello, can you hear me? Good afternoon. First of all, thank you so much. I'm Sasha Johnson, and I'm 11th grader at Long Beach Polytechnic High School. When I first heard of this position, I jumped at the opportunity. I have been in the LBUC school district since I was in kindergarten, and it's very important for me to give back to my community. This year, I was elected to be, by my peers to be a representative at Poly School Site Council. And there, I'm really able to see the importance of having that student voice in a leadership council, whether it's in balancing the budget or implementing new educational initiatives. I find that it is crucial that we have that student input going into decisions that affect the student body. And I also find that it's important that we all contribute to our community, our city, and our democracy. I am so grateful for all the opportunities that LBC has given me. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to invite Corey. Good evening, everyone. My name is Corey Umamoto, and I am a sophomore at CAMS. I applied to be a student board member because I've always been interested in leadership and being involved at my school. I went into high school only knowing one other person. It was very intimidating, but I still knew that I wanted to be a part of ASB and other clubs. But oh, I saw what I could do to make an impact at the high school level, but being presented this amazing opportunity to make an impact at the school district level and represent the 67,000 students. I want to voice the opinions and concerns of various topics at the board meetings. This responsibility will help me to expand my leadership skills beyond what I have ever done before. It was an honor to speak in front of you all today and I thank you all so much for your time. And Frania. Hello, um, I'm a senior. Oh, my name is Frania Lopez. I'm a senior at uh, Jordan High School. Um, I'm a current member of RSVP committee with Dr. Baker. I'm the lead pathway JMAC ambassador for my pathway. Um, and I'm a second year member for my school site council. The reason why I applied for this position was because I was filled with determination and confidence to bring about change because of my personal upbringing when I was in LAUSD. 
I didn't experience, I didn't have a good experience. I felt with a lot of bullying and a lot of academic pressure because I was an advanced magnet student competing for my school. And I reached out for support. Nobody lent me a hand. Even my principal, he just told me to get over it. Um, so I was filled with determination now moving to Long Beach to bring about some change, a positive change for additional support for students because I know what it's like to feel abandoned basically from the people who basically are entrusted with half of your day <laughs> every day for the rest of your school year. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and I wish to bring um, more, uh, more support for the future of LBUSD students because our mental health is really important. Thank you. And Parishi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Parishi Jane, and I'm a junior at California Academy of Math and Science. I'd first like to start off by saying thank you for the amazing opportunity to be here in front of you all tonight. When I first saw the email notifying me about this opportunity, I was amazed. As you all know, Long Beach Unified is the third largest district in California. To be the singular person that represents all 67,000 students in this district was terrifying, but nonetheless, exciting. As I read more about this position, I quickly realized that it was the perfect position for me. Giving back to my community is something that has always been important to me ever since I was a little kid. At a young age, I've always been participating in events and clubs that have allowed me to meet so many different types of people and represent them. As a student board member, I would like to bring my unique perspective on the challenges the students are facing in this district. I am determined to enhance the quality of the learning experience and for all students. I'm confident in my ability to represent not only my voice, but the voices of all 85 schools in Long Beach Unified. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Have a good evening. There are a lot of caring adults in the room with our students as well as us, so I'd like to invite all of us to stand and just acknowledge the talent and the dedication of the students who have just stood before you. So let's take a moment. And at this, at this time, I would like to invite all of the finalists up to the podium. We have certificates for you, and we are going to take a photo of you with the Board of Education tonight. So please come up.
But anyway, um, so thank you for coming and families. I know you're very proud of your uh, students. You should be. They're all amazing, amazing. It's going to be a really hard choice for us. But thank you for being here this evening. Um, and I was going to uh, excuse Celeste, but she excused herself. So, um, <laughs> okay, we'll just keep this uh, meeting rolling. We're, okay, so, yeah. So we will move to recognitions and acknowledgments. Mr. Hi, my name is Hank Waddles and I teach 7th and 8th grade English here at Stanford Middle School. I was an English major in college and because I loved reading books and I loved writing about books and I loved talking about it. And so when I was a senior, it occurred to me that if I became an English teacher, I could do that for the rest of my life. I can't imagine having done anything else for these past 32 years. I spent 19 years at Lindbergh and now this is my 13th year here at Stanford. I run uh, two different clubs. One is Project Lit, which is a book club geared towards exposing kids to stories written by underrepresented authors uh, with underrepresented characters and themes and things like that. I also run the uh, Anti-Racism Club, which is a group of kids that, that come in and, and just kind of talk about uh, equity issues that are impacting us on campus that are impacting them in the school community and then you know we relate that to things that are going on in the wider world around us. I, I have always felt really lucky that I fell into this district because what I love about it is that it's large enough that it services a really um, a really diverse community. There's, you know, you can go to different places in this district, in this city, and it feels different. You know, as a teacher, as a man, as a as a black man in America today, uh, it's just a really. Uh, I feel really lucky that I get to stand here and do this job every day. And I can say from experience. We're really lucky to have Mr. Waddles. Um, Dr. Baker? Well, we have another celebration tonight. I'd like to welcome Dr. Felton Williams and Mr. Shane Hardy. And I don't know if Kateria Hernandez is Kateria here. She's not here. OK. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Williams and Mr. Hardy to the podium. We have a little video, and then we will um, give you the opportunity to, to say something. So Mr. It's in cue the, the video. Well, that was a wonderful minute of an event that you held in December and so welcome and we want to thank you and Dr. Williams I know you have some things to say about Mr. Hardy his connection and we're glad to have you. Good evening uh, uh, Ms. Greg Ed, president board board members executive staff members of the audience my name is Felton Williams and I'm a former member of the board I must say it feels a bit unusual sitting on this side of the dais after sitting on, up there for 16 years, but I find it to be somewhat less stressful. Uh, and notice the nice new furniture. Now, that never would have happened to Chris, Chris Steinhauser. Uh, we waited for your departure, Mr. <laughs> William. I tell you. Uh, but it's a pleasure to return to this building 
and to be acquainted with so many of you, and to introduce a young man I have known and watched grow and mature into someone who has managed to internalize a sense of stewardship and personal integrity. He attended district schools and is now giving back. Shane, along with his colleagues, gave a special Christmas cheer to students at Bernie Elementary, a school he attended. I would hope that this recognition tonight by the district to Shane serves as a source of inspiration to other district alumni to step up and consider doing the same. Shane has always impressed me, even as a young man, as someone with special gifts to include his unyielding faith in God and his conviction to live out his faith. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a pleasure to introduce Shane Hardy. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Williams, uh, the board, and Principal Hernandez, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, uh, for allowing me and my team. If you guys can stand really quick, I couldn't do anything without some of my committee. From Snow on 15th Street, we started this in 2016, and it has. We started at my house as a, just a, a holiday get together. We would get five tons of snow dumped into the front yard, and we would hold a toy drive, and then it just expanded to something that no longer my house could uh, <laughs> host. So we launched a campaign back in 2019, and we had our first gala. Um, and then this year, we had after two years of COVID, we held it on December 3rd and we obtained fi over 500 toys and we were able to go to Bernie Elementary. I'm a fr former Bernie B myself um, and I was able to uh, meet with Dr. Felton Williams and Principal Hernandez and to do a give back to the students. Um, one of their things that they've been working on is stewardship and so I really wanted to um, hone in on how to build a sense of community through Art, artistic expression and so my team myself we all have an artistic expression and we wanted to give back that to the community so I thank you for allowing us to serve on this capacity um, and thank you so much again thank you do you have the certificate okay Mr. Hardy, would you like to come up to board president? And actually, why don't you come receive your certificate, and then we can take a photo of you with the board. Thank you, everyone. 
Um, it's so wonderful to be able to recognize good work that's going on, um, recognize our students this evening. It's a little bit of a different feel tonight, uh, but it's all good. Um, next on the agenda is public hearing, but you know what? I've already taken care of that. So uh, we can, I know, right? <clears throat> so we can move on uh, to public testimony. And I see we, we do not have any um, public testimony for items on the agenda, so we will move to uh, comments for items not listed on the agenda. So comments on an item not listed for discussion today must be about issues that are within the jurisdiction of the board. Please note that due to California law, we the board cannot enter into a discussion on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members or staff may ask uh, clarifying questions or provide clarification regarding the public comments, but such discussion is limited. Each speaker will be provided up to three minutes to make their comments. We provide a timer on the screens so that you can be aware of how much time you have remaining to speak. Total time for public comment um, will be 30 minutes. So our first... Sorry? Total. No, total. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're just used to make me making mistakes tonight. So um, so our first uh, person to speak is Lee O'Day. Is it Lee O'Day? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Good evening. My name is actually Jared Lee O'Day. Um, I'll be uh, playing a recording um, from a Gays Against Groomers member, Joey, who is also a um, Milliken alum. I came out in high school at 15. My family was, at the time, very religious. I had no idea how my mother would react. As it would turn out, the love of a parent for their child transcends anything. She surprised me with her overwhelming support. Had I come out today to a teacher or a staff member in one of these so-called wellness centers, I may not have had the opportunity to strengthen my relationship with my family. I might have been encouraged to hide things from them while being facilitated by misguided views for an agenda that sees kids as dollar signs for big pharma and for organizations like Planned Parenthood. Adolescence is hard enough without gender ideology being pushed by special interests. Kids who might feel they're trans may just be being influenced by peer and other social pressures. Then they're influenced by insidious sources, like those who are operating these centers popping up on our campuses here in Long Beach. My name is Joey Magasim. I'm a Millican High School alumni and a member of Gays Against Groomers, Long Beach chapter. Members of the board, I implore you, turn away from this course of action. Turn away from this folly. Turn away from those who would drive wedges in family relationships. Turn away from those who would make life harder for our kids down the road. Children will succeed where families are strong. And Planned Parenthood only serves to weaken our families, to do irreparable harm to our kids, and, quite literally, to poison an entire generation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Meg Martinez. Hello, good evening. I never thought I'd have to be here. Never had I thought I would be going to school boards or a city council meeting having to speak on the issues happening in today's society. I never imagined I would have to be in an organization to protect children. But here I am, a married lesbian woman having to speak up to keep children safe. I've been following the wellness centers being put on school campuses for the last few months. In no way should there be any type of medical clinic on school campus. It doesn't matter what the organization is. The fact that this board thinks it's okay just shows that you really don't care what happens with students on your campuses. Were you just as equally accepting when you allowed wellness centers in the K through eight schools too? Oh wait, pretty sure this board has been keeping that pretty hush hush. It makes sense why the parents and teachers I've spoken to have no idea that they're even there. Tell me, what does a kindergartner have to learn from Planned Parenthood? In the last five years, the amount of services provided from Planned Parenthood took a huge shift in profit from abortions to transgender health. 12 years old. 
At 12 years old, a child can be referred to a clinic from the campus center within one hour, walk out on puberty blockers. Do you even comprehend the damage that these drugs do to kids? The main drug used is Lupron. Here's some long-term side effects that even continue after disuse. 98% hyperhidrosis, 65% migraine and brain swelling, 37% vaginal and testicular atrophy, 31% depression, emotional liability, altered mental status, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, 10% bone and joint pain, arthritis, blurred disc margins, bone fracture, joint disorder, pelvic fibrosis, increased liver enzymes, serious liver injury, hypertension, and heart murmurs. That's a fraction of the side effects in aftermarket reports. Now tell me, do you honestly think a 12-year-old can comprehend the dangers of puberty blockers? I'm sure most adults don't even understand. Those that do don't have the well-being of children in mind. Now, this board has paved a pathway for impressionable kids to fall into a lifelong medical dependence in the name of inclusion. Inclusion would be for each board member to include these kids referred off your campuses for gender treatments in your personal monthly budget. You took their health into your hands, then expect the parents to pay for the mess you created. None of the parents even know what's going on. They didn't consent to this. There wasn't a vote from parents okaying Planned Parenthood on their campuses. Even worse, the schools in Planned Parenthood are keeping the medicalization of their children away from them. I'm Meg Martinez, Gays Against Groomers co-chapter leader for Long Beach with my wife. We're here. We're speaking up. We're going to fight to protect these kids, even if you won't. Thank you. Um, next, we have Jen Martinez. I'm Jen Martinez, Gays Against Groomers, Long Beach co-chapter leader with my wife. We've received many concerns from local parents about what Planned Parenthood Wellness Center means for their students at Jordan High School. I see many have come here on the, on, based on their religious views, which I respect that. However, it is not why we are here. We are here because we know exactly what Planned Parenthood's newish cash cow is. It's transitioning kids. Grooming is defined as building a relationship of trust and emotional connection with a child or young person and separating them from their parents in order to manipulate, exploit, and abuse them. This can be done sexually, ideologically, and politically. This is exactly what putting Planned Parenthood on campus would be promoting. They like to use the term gender-affirming care to make it sound less nefarious. In reality, they offer no other care to gender dysphoric children, they just push the affirmation only narrative because it's the most lucrative. Statistically, if left alone, these kids would grow up to be healthy and happy gay and lesbian adults. It seems as though transing the gay away is becoming the new norm. In reality, it's becoming the erasure of the next generation of gays and lesbians. Within an hour of the first appointment, a minor can be prescribed puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones using the informed consent model, AKA they get a pamphlet and they're allowed to decide with no education about side effects of these hormones, whether or not they understand this is consent to being potentially sterilized and losing all sexual function. They say they don't do this to minors without parental consent, but what would you say if you were a parent and they're telling you, would you rather have a dead daughter or a living son? This is coercion, that's not a choice. Why have all the health teachers that should be teaching sex ed been let go? Why is it that many of your teachers and nearly all of the parents have no idea that this so-called wellness center was being put on this campus? If the board thought it was such a great idea, then why was it treated like a secret? The only thing I can think of is that you all knew it was controversial and that the parents wouldn't be okay with it. Yet you proceeded, hiding it from parents and staff. That goes back to the definition of groomer. You know what you are doing. You know that it's wrong. Do the right thing and stop this. Thank you. Next we have Stephanie Perez. My name is Stephanie Perez, and I'm a teacher at Jordan High School. So I came here before, but I come to you today with one message, and that is, everything aside, it's the parents. When a parent calls my classroom, I know that child is gonna be wildly more successful. As educators, we know 
that the more parent involvement, the better, the more successful the child is going to be. And I feel like everybody can agree on that. What this is doing, though, to be honest, is it's taking away the parental voice. A child goes inside there, says, don't tell my mom, oh, no, we don't do that here. You are severing the relationship between the parent and the student. We know that more parent involvement, that's what we need. How do we increase our A's and B's? More parent involvement. How do we increase anything on campus? More parent involvement. This honestly just takes it away. You're taking away the parental voice. And as teachers and parents, we come together in order to help our students succeed. I ask you, have, have you talked to any of the parents? Was there any questioning? How do you guys feel? Did anybody talk to teachers or staff? How do we feel? This is our second home. I love Jordan. I feel, honestly, I really, really do. And there was no communication. And to be honest, are, are the well-being people, are they going to be there? They're supposed to be there. We know nothing. There was no communication with us as to we think they're supposed to be there February 1st. Maybe they were supposed to be there on Monday at the beginning of the semester. Who knows? We don't know anything. And that's a huge problem. We pride ourselves on clarity, on communication. We know nothing. So for me, to be honest, that's a really big red, red flag. Have you asked the community members? The moment we brought it up to our families and communities, we have 600 600 signatures already of people who are opposed to this. I ask you, please, talk to our community, talk to our families. And if you still want to go through with this, then so be it. But to be honest, we didn't talk to anybody. Nobody knew anything. And so I ask you, put this on the agenda to vote about it, to talk to the teachers, talk to the families. We want to work together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Albert Huerta. Hello. Uh, tonight, as I speak, actually, um, my mom fights for her life. She's in the hospital right now after a severe heart attack. And as she fights for life, I'm as well with my colleagues here. We're fighting for life as well. Uh, the, life, the right to life, as described uh, in the Constitution, and as described in your guys' textbooks here at Jordan, at Jordan High School, which begins at conception. Well, in 2018, Governor Jerry Brown vetoed a bill, SB 320, introduced by Senator Connie uh, Leiva uh, from Chino. And in his veto message, uh, Governor Brown called the bill unnecessary, noting that abortions are a long protected right in California. He said most abortion providers are within a reasonable distance from campus communities anyways. So you see, do you understand? This isn't about rights. This is intrusion into our education system and into parental control. It is at the very least unnecessary, but it's mostly targeted at making lifelong customers to abortions by Planned Parenthood. Having a business like Planned Parenthood on campus sends a very bad message to the community. I would have hoped that you all would have looked into what Planned Parenthood is, especially in regards to their racist roots and racist targeting into communities. The founder of Planned Parenthood had he, these kind words to say about the black population. What, we don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. She said that in 1938. I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan. I was escorted to the platform, was introduced, and began to speak. In the end, through simple illustrations, I believed and I had accomplished, I had accomplished my purpose. A dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were uh, proffered. That was in 1938 as well. And apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population, talking about the black community, whose pro, uh, prognosis, prognosis is tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to their offspring. Clearly, this is a racist organization. There are a few bedrock, those are just a few bedrock quotes from uh, the founder herself. There is now severe mistrust between the parents of Long Beach and LBUSD. This plan was put into action under a gentler name like Wellbeing Center, while covering the fact that Planned Parenthood employees would be on campus with fr a fresh opportunity to sales pitch our children to an abortion. Well,
At this moment, I just want to tell you this. I will begin this campaign in Long Beach to get the word out and encourage parents to withdraw their children from this school district because this topic must be agendized and I urge you guys to agendize this topic. It is not okay with the community. I've talked to enough parents. We're not okay with this. We easily got 600 signatures. No problem. We can get plenty more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Gilmore. It's been a while since I've gone up here and spoken for a while. Uh, anyways, Tim Gilmore. Uh, the two things that I want to talk about tonight that I'm kind of concerned about is really the main thing I'm really concerned about is our earthquake preparation. Um, I don't think we're necessarily ready for it. Um, uh, about three years ago when we had COVID and I had some health issues, uh, Ms. Sawyer and I were talking about uh, the preparations at Poly High School. And I shared my concerns as well from her because I was on the PTA and we spent some money and we, we paid for an earthquake kit, which was really important at the time. Uh, but in also finding out that on that earthquake kit, uh, there wasn't include uh, a generator at all. And I basically called the district office and talked to Mr. Hickman about it. And I said, well, if we needed to, could we uh, you know, order it? And he said that he could work with us on it and stuff. And so I brought it to the attention and so on. Um, I don't th I think it's really a big problem and we should really look into it and so hopefully we can uh, I've brought it up the site council meetings as such as too um, the other thing I want to discuss is we really need to bring back uh, football back to Long Beach Poly High School uh, the football coaches want it uh, to bring it back at a limited amount of schedule as long as it makes good financial sense and such uh, to improve the morale the community and uh, since we're spending a lot of money there uh, with uh, improving the school itself, they're actually uh, looking into putting a parking structure and stuff. I went to the, uh, the meeting, the town meeting with LPA, and I listened to it very intently. And so I think that that's really important uh, that we really look into that and such and everything. Um, but also um, the good news that uh, I'd like to share with, which was really good, is that uh, they finally found an instructor uh, that hired them at Poly ROTC, which is really good because I've, I know that program is so important. It's important for the leadership and so on, and it's something that we really need to, to look into. And hopefully someday we can maybe get it reestablished in some, some other schools uh, and everything. Uh, and the last thing, another suggestion that I'd like to see us do is when we have school board meetings, it would really be great maybe if we had them at school sites instead of just being here. You know, try to get more people involved in civic. We've, we did it a long time ago, uh, as I remember with John McGinnis, when we did the, uh, I think it was, uh, we did it at Renaissance, it was, and, and uh, he wanted to go over the construction part of it, and I thought it was pretty successful, but I know there is some logistical issues. But I'd like to see if we could really look into that. Uh, I thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, we have Huku Jeffrey. Okay, he doesn't appear to be here. Um, Sheena da Dennis. I almost said Davis, but Sheena Dennis. You know who I, am. I do know who you are. <laughs> Well, relax your faces. Come on. Okay. Um, well, I'm one of the parents at, not parents, I'm one of the community members at Jordan High School. And I'm speaking on um, the wellness, well, well, well-being center coming, slash parenthood center coming to on campus at Jordan. Um, I was confused because I try and keep my ears to the school as far as uh, find, keeping the communi my community where I live involved. And I can't understand how I missed it. Did we not have meetings? 
Did we not let the community know? Because I didn't know, and I pretty much know everything that's going. I'm a. I pretty much know everything that's going on in my community, and this just went right past me. And I didn't. I don't appreciate. It. I thought we were supposed to be equitable, to uh, inclusive. Uh, what do you say? Um, transparent. I had no information, and I don't appreciate it because I know you guys are the leaders in this in the school district. I started here in the Long Beach at from kindergarten up to 12th grade. I graduated in 1978 from Jordan High School. So I've been in Long Beach all my life. So I love my Long Beach because I left and went to Irvine and came back. So I love my Long Beach. So I need to know what's going on. I have solutions. We do need the Planned Parenthood in our community in North Long Beach. But with that being said, why can't we make it a um, mobile unit? That you have, you have those two days that you plan on coming, make it a mobile unit and make it available to the community, not to the school. Because the school is for the students to learn that the parents are entrusting the school to do, educate the students in the school, not with Planned Parenthood. That doesn't Come on, if you had a child that you know has given you problems and they go up to the school with the problem, the wellness center that's there at the school is very, very helpful. I've used it with my grandson when he went there. The wellness center is wonderful for, my, for, for what I've seen. But this well-being, because that was the, the catch, is the well-being slash Planned Parenthood, you, it's like you covered it up. We need more information, we need to abstain abstain from doing that at this moment, but we do need Planned Parenthood in North Long Beach. Bring it, but bring that little mobile unit, okay? The one that's that truck that, you know, like you do the whatever it is, that, that truck. Bring that, that's good for the community, not for just the students. Make it available to, to the community. That's all I needed to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shana. Uh, next on the agenda is our consent calendar A. Uh, this consent calendar groups the approval of routine agenda items into one action for efficiency and to allow the board to focus our meetings more on student outcomes and other key issues of the district. Um, is there any discussion regarding items on consent calendar A? Mm -hmm. Dr. Benitez? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'd love, uh, I saw Mr. Horizon just walk in right now, right on cue, Alan. Um, there's an item in our 14.7 approval of purchasing and contracts report, actually item 14, um, that is connected to important resolution that our board passed and the facilities master plan that we adopted uh, last year around our sustainability efforts, our green school efforts, and so I noticed that we're moving forward with a sustainability plan. Uh, Alan, if you could speak to that, I think this is important for our community to know. Hey, we passed this green uh, resolution last year. We adopted a facilities master plan that was, uh, that one of the priorities was to expand and strengthen our sustainability efforts. And so I was happy to see this. If you could speak to this, uh, Alan, I think this is one of those areas that our community, uh, it would be important for them to know that we're following up with our plans uh, to uh, move forward on our sustainability efforts. Absolutely, thank you. So I draw your attention to item number 13 on our consent report, on our purchasing of contracts report. This is a, an agreement with Cumming Management Group. Uh, this is a firm that we've identified to help us with our uh, sustainability initiatives. Uh, back in July of 2022, after a c considerable effort of engaging with our community, uh, student-led groups uh, resulted in the board adopting a board resolution or board policy 3510.1, which was our green school operations policy. Really, that was a uh, first attempt to really identify the need for our school district to uh, adopt policies that really deal with uh, cl the climate crisis, uh, and uh, environmental uh, justice that, that we deal with on a daily basis in our society. Uh, part of that policy was uh, really establishing goals for how we would analyze and uh, adjust our policies and our practices across our district related to uh, sustainability, everything from 
uh, waste management to recycling to energy to water to all of those different areas of, of sustainability. Uh, following that, that board policy, we began a process of identifying uh, firms in the industry that could come in and help us to do uh, some of the heavy lifting to really analyze our practices and policies. Uh, we put an RFP on the streets and identified, I think it was about eight different firms that proposed. Went through a robust selection process where we identified coming uh, con construction management to help us with this. Uh, this will be about a 17 month uh, program. The first six months we're, we're hoping to, uh, to bring by August some uh, new policies uh, to the board for adoption to, to really uh, look at how we are going to ultimately change some of our practices and policies across the district. And then we'll be moving into a year-long process of implementation, uh, education, training, and support to our staff uh, uh, we, with the, the goal of implementing full implementation in, in that 17-month time, timeline. This includes a, a robust level of community engagement, including the forming of our Community Crisis and Sustainability Task Force, which would be an opportunity for to continue to engage with our community and our, and our stakeholder groups uh, as we look towards uh, improving our footprint in, in the world that, that our district has. So we're happy to present that to the board today. Thank you, Alan. Good news. Yes, thank you. Um, do we have any other? Oh, Mr. Otto. Oh, sorry. I just I left that. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to have um, Dr. Simon, if you don't mind, um, talk about the 14.8. Um, <laughs> Dr. Brown, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> <don't> mind. <laughs> one I of the doctors mind. on this side of the room um, <laughs> talk about uh, item number 14.8, amendment to board policy, administering medication, that kind of thing. Thank you for the opportunity. So this item adds to an existing board policy on administering medication and monitoring health conditions and allows for the use of naloxone, um, also commonly referred to as Narcan, by trained staff. This medication would be used in the event of a perceived or real opioid overdose. And it will be available, we've been working in partnership with the health department who has provided an order for us to be a recipient of medication. We will be working with our school nurses who will be trained in the administration of Narcan as needed in the event of a perceived opioid overdose and we will be further communicating to schools around the implementation. But this item adds to a policy that has existed for quite some time to address the current needs and the concerns around the possibility of an opioid overdose. And would this be at the high school level or would that include other, other levels? We're making it available to all, all schools. All school nurses will be explicitly trained, and then schools will determine if additional staff need to be trained as well. OK, well, if, if we're talking about all school levels, we would have to have additional staff trained because our school nurses aren't on generally speaking they're not on campus 100 percent of the time that we have to share um, campuses that's correct and so in the coming weeks we'll be working with each school site to determine um, an appropriate group of staff that could be present and able to respond as needed but i think the key part here is that they'll be trained they'll be trained correct. to identify the uh, situation and they'll be trained to administer that that's correct. Narcan type drug. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other uh, questions or comments about our consent calendar A? We're going to do something different tonight. We're going to have our board secretary uh, take this vote. Do we have to make the motion to approve? Mm, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we, yes. Yes. So I move to approve consent calendar A. Okay. Member Benitez, how do you vote? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. So this passes 5-0. Uh, Thank you, Letitia. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to consent calendar B on the agenda. Um, 
I need I need a motion. Move to approve. Consent Second. calendar B. Second. Uh, discussion? Yes. I will recuse myself from consent calendar B as I have a potential conflict of interest under government code section 1090 and 87100. SoCal Gas has provided services to the Long Beach Unified School District and has in the last 12 months provided a donation to the nonprofit cor organ corporation Rancho Los Amigos Foundation, which I am the CEO. Thank you. And we will also have our board secretary um, take this roll call vote as well. Thank you. Member Benitez, how do you vote? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. So this passes 4 0 with uh, Mr. Miller abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Letitia. Um, next, we move to staff report. I'll hand things over to Dr. Baker. Thank you. Mr. Strumpfer is going to be making a presentation. So as he's coming up to the podium, I'd just like to introduce this item. Tonight, this item will be um, part of our governance journey. So about two and a half years ago, we started um, to think about governance in the way that we consider student outcomes in a transition for the Board of Education. That included creating a Board of Education handbook that has actually gone through a revision or an update each year. It included the board's vote on new bylaws in the fall. And this is a next step in our governance journey to include annual training of which tonight Mr. Strumpfer will address the Brown Act and ethics for Board of Education members. Our plan is that in the future, an abbreviated version of this will be part of annual training for the Board of Education. So tonight's a first installation, and perhaps as we move forward each year, it will become a, a shorter version as we build the capacity of the board. And so I will introduce Mr. Strumpfer. Strumpfer. <laughs> Thank you, Superintendent Baker. Uh, good evening, uh, President Craighead, board members. Uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the Brown Act, uh, ethics training, and a little bit about the, the dreaded Form 700 that we all have to fill out by uh, April 1st. So first off, we're going to talk a little bit about the Brown Act. Uh, it's actually celebrating its 70th birthday this year, uh, and it was created uh, to uh, make us more accessible to the public. Um, to allow the public access to our meetings. Uh, the idea is you spend public funds, you run public schools, the public therefore has the opportunity to hear you, to see what you do, to see how you vote, and also have an opportunity, as we saw tonight, give public comment as well. Uh, the main thing with the Brown Act to remember is it applies to meetings. Uh, sometimes people throw around the Brown Act anytime there's a, a board issue. It really is involving public meetings. That's what it's about. And <clears throat> the definition of a meeting uh, is when a majority of the board is together talking about school business, right? So you could have two of you go to lunch uh, at a restaurant and you could talk all you want about board business, no violation. You can have all five of you get together for a Super Bowl party you know, a week from Sunday. Uh, as long as you don't talk about school business, it's not a Brown Act violation. Now, I would warn you against that because at halftime, if you get bored, what would the five of you have in common? School business, you'd probably talk about, at some point, the district, right? Unlikely uh, that we get bored at halftime at the Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I should say maybe by the third quarter if it's the Eagles game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, Justin, yeah. Uh, uh, so it's the, it's the combination. It's the majority of the board and it's school business. Uh, and meetings can happen in person. Uh, if three of you happen to be uh, shopping at Trader Joe's at the same time and run into each other, there could be a Brown Act violation in the frozen food section. It has happened, actually. Uh, and, and also it can happen more commonly by email or by text message. So one thing to always remember is when you are emailed uh, as a group, never ever respond all. Always reply back usually to Superintendent Baker or whoever it is who sent it, but don't hit reply all because at that point you're then talking about school business to all five board members. Also avoid texting, uh, well, maybe just in general, but avoid texting, particularly text groups, right? So if, the, if, there, if you have two other board members on your text group, you're violating the Brown Act if you're talking about school business. 
there are some exceptions to the rule. One of them would be if you would go, let's say, to city council and there is an item that involves Long Beach Unified. If three or four or five of you went to that meeting, you would not need to follow the rules of the Brown Act because that meeting is following the Brown Act. The city council is doing that, right? They're agendizing, they're putting the item on the agenda, they're noticing it correctly. You can sort of piggyback on their work. You don't have to notify uh, your uh, constituent. You can just follow their rules. Uh, um, you can also go to- Excuse uh, me. Yes. Can I just uh, interject just a little bit? Please. So you're saying that if the five of us were to attend a city council meeting, it would be perfectly okay for us to discuss the item on their agenda. That's correct. But it would not be okay for us to talk about other school district business. Right, and I often call the Brown Act sort of an antisocial law. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you all five would go to that meeting, uh, you can go up and speak in public, uh, but what you don't wanna do is sit next to each other and start talking about school business, right? So it's specifically for public comment or to be there to show your support or whatever it might be at that meeting, right? Uh, at conferences, at graduations, uh, at fundraisers, again, uh, a majority of you can attend those things, uh, but you wanna make sure again that you're not talking about school business in a group. So if you're graduation or if you're at a conference, uh, you basically want to avoid uh, getting together as a group. Now at a graduation, if for some reason all five of you would sit together, that's fine, but don't start talking about board business, right? Uh, one thing to remember too are serial meetings. Sometimes uh, people don't realize that, and, and I'll use an example of what I mentioned earlier. It was fine for two of you to be going to have lunch, right? You could have lunch, you could talk about board business. Let's say the budget's coming up, you could talk about the budget with each other, that's fine. When it becomes a problem is if one of you then goes to a third board member and says, oh, you know, I had lunch with board member A and we both agreed we're gonna vote this way and we're gonna do this about the budget. Now you have brought in a third person into your meeting of two and you've created a majority and that is against the Brown Act. That's considered a serial meeting. Uh, you can see, the, the other time that can sometimes come up is let's say you call the superintendent to talk about an item on the agenda. Uh, she may have talked to another board member or two other board members about that same item. She wants to make sure not to let you know, oh, you know, I, I talked to President Craighead and she said she's gonna vote this way. She doesn't wanna do that to Member Miller, right? She wants to keep that separate and keep it away from each other so that you don't know. The idea is one member, then two members, then three members, and all of a sudden you all know uh, how you're voting and what's gonna happen before the meeting. And that's the thing that we should avoid. Um, the other time this comes up occasionally uh, is in social media. And we actually have a new law regarding social media on this. Uh, and it was always kind of a question of, well, what if uh, one of you posts on Facebook uh, about board business? What if two more of you hit the like button or comment on that post? That could be considered right, a board meeting because there's three of you in an area, which would be the Facebook page, uh, and you're commenting on school business. So without determining whether that actually is a Brown Act violation or not, the legislature created a new law this past year that says you can't post on another board member's posting. Right? So don't like another board member's post, don't comment on another board member's post, uh, and if you ask me, stay off Facebook, but that's a whole other thing, yeah. Um, so just be careful of that as well. Um, the other thing that, that sometimes happens uh, that you just wanna be careful of, and again, this is sort of an antisocial thing, and that is I, I have seen in, in other areas where uh, board members will adjourn for the evening and they go outside and three or four members end up standing by someone's car and talking about the, the meeting for that evening, right? And what are they doing? They're talking about school business, a majority outside somebody's SUV, right? And that can technically be a Brown Act violation. So you just wanna be careful uh, in, in when you talk to each other and how you do it. Teleconferencing uh, 
is a little crazy right now. Uh, before the pandemic, it was pretty straightforward. There were certain rules you had to follow. And then the pandemic kind of turned it on its head. And of course, all of you remember uh, the Zoom meetings. Uh, now it's kind of uh, in between. Uh, and what I just want to mention to you about teleconferencing is if, if any of you are going to be out of the area and you want to attend the meeting, let's sit down and talk about it. Because there are certain rules that apply uh, and there are certain exceptions now and certain emergencies. So if something happens where you want to uh, teleconference in, let's talk about it and see if we can make that work. Uh, the public notice and agendas, just real quick, uh, notice for a regular meeting like we're having tonight, uh, you have to give 72 hours notice under the Brown Act. Uh, we actually give about 96 hours of notice. Uh, we usually post on Friday for Wednesday. Uh, special meetings uh, only uh, require 24 hour notice and an emergency meeting is just a one hour notice. But emergency meetings are very rare and should only be called if there's a true emergency uh, that you can't wait 24 hours for. Uh, typically, we're very leery of, of calling emergency meetings. Uh, and the notice is the agenda, right? You see the agenda and sometimes you'll see you know, little changes there. But what I, I've tried to do is make sure that we are just explaining to the public what we're talking about, right? What we're doing. Are we acting or are we discussing? And then the other thing is I always try to just uh, make the wording in a way that is uh, for a member of the public who knows nothing about the school district, if they were to read the agenda, they understand what you're doing. Right? So we try to avoid initials, we try to spell things out, and we give people an understanding of what it is they're talking about. Public comment during meetings. Uh, the public obviously has a right to speak, uh, but there are time limits. There are certain limits you can have. There was, one of them is time limits. There's a, a California appellate court decision that found that uh, the board can limit the time to three minutes per speaker, per item and a reasonable amount of time for total time. And we usually go 30 minutes. Uh, and what we need to make sure is that we just keep that to be a reasonable time. And we have seen this over the past couple of meetings where that has worked out just fine, right? By 30 minutes, we get most people on. And when people aren't able to speak, they're able to leave written comments for the board to, to address. So um, some uh, districts are starting to limit time to two minutes but that has not been approved by the courts yet. Uh, we probably will see that at some point addressed by the courts, but we know that three minutes is okay, so that's what we do here. Disruptive speakers, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, there's a new law that came out after COVID, and it uh, says that we can kick disruptive speakers out. Uh, typically what you need to do, President Craighead gives one warning, uh, and on the second warning, you can kick uh, them out. If there is a large, and, and, and when I talk about disruptive, I mean they're disrupting your business, right? If someone is speaking and they're rude, uh, you kind of have to put up with that. Uh, but if, on the other hand, uh, they're chanting while you're trying to vote or trying to speak, uh, or they're uh, loud or they're clapping when you're trying to do your business, um, that's disruptive and you can kick them out of the meeting. Uh, Responding to comments, we've talked about that a little bit tonight, actually. On agenda items, you can have a full conversation with a member of the public. If they're commenting on an agenda item, you can ask them questions, you can engage, you can have a full conversation. On non-agenda items, you need to be limited because we haven't noticed that item, right? So we're not going to have a major conversation about something that's not on the agenda for the public. Um, typically, you can ask clarifying questions or perhaps staff may want to give clarifying information, uh, or a board member can ask uh, a staff member, could you look into this further? Let me know what, you know, if there's something interesting that you find from a, a member of the public, uh, you can do that. Um, but you need to limit your discussion. We need not to have a full discussion on a non-agenda item because then we have a problem with notice. Closed session, just real quickly. There are six uh, permissible items we can talk about, only six. Uh, one is pending and anticipated litigation. Another is pupil discipline, which we reported out today. Uh, personnel, real estate negotiations, labor negotiations, and public security. 
Uh, one thing to know is that when you do take votes, when you take action on something in closed session, you do have to report that out. Um, the, the law says uh, reasonably immediately, so that's why we do that so early on in our board meeting as we come out of closed session into open session and we report uh, what action was taken in closed session. And those are only for voting uh, actions that are taken. Okay, that's the Brown Act in 10 minutes, so I'm doing okay on time here. Uh, understanding conflicts of interest. Let's talk a little bit about conflicts of interest. Uh, and I always think of conflicts as being, as being this. You have uh, your own personal interests, right? You have your job, you have your finances, and they're here. And over here is your school, your, your school district board member. And these are your school district decisions. And what you want to avoid is ever having them uh, combine, right? You want to keep them apart from each other. So if you have a financial interest in something, you want to just make sure that it doesn't collide with any decision you're making uh, as a board member. Um, typically, it's going to be a financial decision. Um, there are occasionally, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, is Government Code 1090 and the Political Reform Act. But I, I did want to make a quick note that occasionally it might be an interest that is not financial. Uh, occasionally it might be, let's say you have a brother who you have no financial connection to. They're an adult brother. They have their own life. You have no financial connection. But they may want to contract with the district. Uh, under the law, under the common law, you would want to recuse yourself because it appears as though you may have a conflict of interest because it's your brother or your best friend or something like that. So it's not always just financial. It typically is, but sometimes you just want to be careful not, think about the appearance of how it would look. Uh, if you, and if you have any questions, let's talk about it. <laughs> typically, uh, I say, you know, if you're, if you're in doubt, you might want to, you know, the old saying is, if in doubt, sit it out. You may want to uh, avoid voting on something if you're feeling like, gosh, this may be a conflict of interest. Uh, Government Code 1090, <coughs> excuse me, is kind of the granddaddy of uh, ethics. Government Code 1090 says if you're a public official uh, making a public contract, which in your case would be voting for it, uh, and that public official has a financial interest in the contract, you're in violation of Government Code 1090. Uh, and it can be, it's a felony offense. Uh, if you're convicted, you can no longer uh, hold office in California. Uh, and we've seen it happen a few times uh, in California, uh, including our, our former uh, superintendent of schools of the state. Um, and one thing to remember is if one board member has a financial interest like Government Code 1090. The whole board cannot vote on it. Okay, it's a it's it. If let's say, for instance, President Craighead, you own a business and you yeah, that business decides it wants to contract with Long Beach Unified. Uh, you have a financial interest, obviously, so you're not going to vote. But what 1090 says is no one can vote on that. You cannot say, oh, excuse myself, and then wink, wink, the other board members are going to vote for it, and you get to have the contract. So it keeps us from doing that <clears throat> and keeps kind of guardrails on how you vote, but none of you could vote on that type of contract. Now, there are exceptions, and I will say that Government Code 1090 is incredibly convoluted uh, and sometimes hard to follow. Uh, I've been doing it for about 24 years, and there are still times where I have questions that I've got to go back and look at and, and determine uh, what is a conflict and what is not. <laughs> the couple of things to think about uh, is in Section uh, 1091, it talks about remote interests. And what a remote interest is, is it's an interest, but it's not so bad that all of you cannot vote on it, right? So a remote interest would be the board member recuses themselves and the other board members can vote on it, okay? So there are a few exceptions to the rule. One, for instance, would be contracts with nonprofits where the official is employed. We actually had that this evening uh, with Mr. Miller, uh, who is employed by a nonprofit, and it's not quite the same thing, but it's close. It's the same idea, uh, and that is, you know, to, to recuse yourself from anything that may look like a financial interest, but yet the rest of you could still vote on that, okay? Uh, another one would be where contracts and entities that donate, this is actually Mr. Miller, exactly, contracts with entities that donate to, no, to uh, nonprofits where official is employed. 
and then also contracting with entities or individuals who employs uh, officials minor child. There are several other exceptions, but these are the main ones that you'll see. Government Code 1091.5 actually deems some what you might think to be interests as non-interests and say, no, you can go ahead and vo vote on some of these things that you might think would be a violation. <coughs> One would be if an official is a spouse of an employee of the district, if the spouse's employment has existed at least for one year, uh, the spouse can then vote on issues involving that, that spouse, which would be like a budget or a uh, contract approval, that kind of thing. There may be some other limits, uh, but from a financial perspective and voting in general, if the spouse has been with the district for at least one year, it's considered not to be uh, a conflict of interest. Another one would be a contract with a nonprofit entity in which the official is non-salaried board member or employee. So for instance, if you're a <coughs> excuse me, if you're a board member on a nonprofit and you're not paid, if that nonprofit decides to do business or contract with Long Beach Unified, that's fine. It's considered a nonprofit, plus you're not paid for it, therefore what the law is saying is there's no conflict of interest in those situations. Any questions? Are we doing okay? We're moving along. Actually, I have a question. <clears throat> Would this be a conflict of interest or a non-interest if we were um, voting on uh, new employees or whatever and we were related or connected in some way? Would we have to recu recuse ourselves in that situation? If you were specifically voting for an employee who was, uh, well, a couple different situations. But generally, you would need to uh, ex excuse yourself from a vote if you were voting, if it was your, uh, particularly your son, daughter, husband, or wife. Uh, it, the more distant the relation gets, the, the more distant the conflict of interest becomes. Um, but for uh, um, your immediate family, yes, you would want to recuse yourself, but the rest of the board could vote. This goes way back to uh, Brown Act questions. Sure. Um, so um, 20 people st uh, sign up to, to speak at a meeting. Um, uh, 19 of them are about one topic and one of them about a completely different topic. And um, the, uh, the 19 uh, take up 29 minutes and 30 seconds and um, and the person who's got a brand new topic stands up and says, and I'd like to speak now, and they say, the time's up. So the question is, is the time that is allotted limited to the total amount of public comment time, or can it be broken down by topic? Yeah, what the law says is, is that you need to allow a reasonable time for members of the public to comment. The board can decide that. What the courts have said is that if you want to limit it to 30 minutes, that's legal and that's uh, okay with the Brown Act. But it doesn't say that you can only hold it to 30 minutes. So for instance, if the board would decide, you know, let's say there's another 30 people out who want to speak, if you want to give another 15 minutes or 20 minutes, you can do that. If you have a, one other uh, speaker who was talking about something totally different and the time's up, the board could say, you know what, we're gonna go ahead and give this person three minutes because it's something else. So there's no hard and fast rule that you can't allow more time. It's just uh, that 30 minutes, you have to give at least 30 minutes, uh, and if you want to limit it, you can to that amount. But you can go beyond if you care to do that. But 30 minutes isn't a hard and fast rule. It's, it's, it's not a hard and fast rule. The courts have just found that it, it complies with the Brown right. Act, but yeah, yeah. But also in that situation, <clears throat> If I saw that um, one of my colleagues wanted to extend time, then I would need a motion from from one of us on the board. Yes, typically, typically to that's best. Time. Yeah, typically that's best to take a motion, a second, and a quick vote. Uh, I've seen it <laughs> formally, and I've seen it informally, where you as the president could say, is everybody okay if we go another three minutes with this speaker? And everyone sort of nods, you can go ahead and do it. Um, it's good to follow formal rules. And we like to do that here to you know, a certain extent. Um, so having a motion in a second is a good practice. Yeah. 
Are we doing all questions now, Chair, or are we going to wait? <clears throat> well, let's check in with Mr. Strumpfer and see if he wants questions <laughs> now or if he would like to wait. I, I'm, I'm still going to talk about the, the Political Reform Act, but if you want to talk about something that as we've already started on, I'm happy to take questions. I can wait. I just didn't know if we wanted to take a deep dive. All right. Uh, so the Political Reform Act is the other law that talks about conflict of interest. And the Political Reform Act was created in 1974, the year of Watergate. Uh, and the idea behind it was that we, as a, a society, was becoming a little skeptical of our governments following uh, Watergate. And so the Political Reform Act has a number of different parts to it. One of them is a voting prohibition. Uh, another one is reporting rule, and another one involves campaign funds. Uh, tonight, we're just going to talk about voting prohibition and, and reporting. Uh, the, the voting prohibition is very similar to 1090. The big difference is in 1090, it is only involves contracts if you have a financial interest in a contract. The Political Reform Act is any decision that you make. Most of your decisions are going to be contracts, so 1090 will usually rule. But occasionally we'll see where a school district might vote on a curriculum or mo might vote on something that isn't a contract. And if that's the case, then the Political Reform Act applies and 1090 doesn't apply because 1090 only applies to contracts. But the rules are pretty much the same. Uh, the difference is it's not a felony, it's a misdemeanor. Uh, and the, the other difference is, is that with the Political Reform Act, if one of you recuses yourself, the rest of you can vote. It's not an issue. Okay. So that's the quick story on the voting. If you have more questions, we can talk about that. I'm, I'm trying to be fairly quickly, pretty quick tonight, so I'm happy to answer more questions about it. I did want to talk a little bit about the reporting rules with Form 700. Uh, as you know, it's due every year on April 1st, uh, and there can be financial pen penalties for being late, and it actually is a misdemeanor if you decide you're not going to fill it out, so you want to make sure you fill it out. Uh, board members typically have broad disclosures. Uh, you have to disclose everything that's on the Form 700, uh, but there are several exceptions to the rules. Uh, the reporting rules are uh, that you need to report financial, and I'll back up just for a second. The reason for this Form 700, people sometimes wonder why this exists, because it is sometimes difficult to kind of go through and figure out. The idea behind this was, again, we go back to 1974, and people said, hey, we want to hold uh, our, our political leaders accountable, and we don't trust them to police themselves, so we want to see what their financial interests are in order to determine that they're not voting on what are their financial interests, right? So that's the reason for the reporting. You need to report what your financial interests are so the public, if they choose to, can see what yours are and to kind of police you to make sure that you're not voting on something that you have financial interest in. And that's what this Form 700 does. So you have to uh, disclose any investment in a business entity of $2,000 or more. So if you own a business, uh, you have to report that on your Form 700. If your spouse owns a business, you have to report that on your Form 700. Real estate property investments of $2,000 or more, which is kind of funny now, uh, almost 40 years later, I don't know of, of a property investment that wouldn't be under, you know, over $2,000, especially in Long Beach. So really, any, any real property investment has to be reported, but there's exceptions, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, income, the, your income source of $500 or more, and that also includes your spouse. If your spouse has income of $500 or more, you have to report that as well. And then gifts uh, of $50 or more. If it is a lobby, and I'll recommend uh, that you never go have lunch with lobbyists. There's many reasons not to have lunch with lobbyists, but one of them would be you cannot accept a gift of more than $10 from a lobbyist. Um, the Political Reform Act does not care for lobbyists very much and puts a lot of limits on them. And this is one where if there is a lobbyist and you have lunch, buy your own lunch because there's rules as to what you can do. Uh, there's also a limit on accumulated gifts for a full calendar year and that is $590. Um, now, there's also exceptions to gifts, so before you start worrying about what your, your husband or wife got you or what your family members got you or your best friend got you, there are exceptions to the gift rules. So let's talk about the exceptions for a minute. 
with investments in business of $2,000 or more, uh, it's only businesses that are within the district's jurisdiction. <coughs> Excuse me. So for instance, if you decide to invest in your best friend's business and they're up in San Francisco and they don't do business in Long Beach at all and don't do business with school districts, you don't have to report that. Okay? It's only if they're doing business in Long Beach jurisdiction and it involves something that schools might use. Okay? Uh, real property investments of $2,000 or more, again, uh, must be within LBUSD's jurisdiction only. If you own a rental home in Arizona, you don't have to report that. Uh, the other rule is you don't have to report your own residence. So if you own your house and live in it, you don't have to report that. You're really just reporting rental property in that situation. Income of $500 or more, if you work in the public sector, you don't have to report your income. If your spouse works in the public sector, you don't have to report their income. It's only private sector income that you have to report. And then gift reports and limitations, you do not have to report gifts from family, most friends, and for special holidays. So if you celebrate a, ho a holiday, uh, and you share gifts with another friend or another family member, you don't have to sit down and keep track of how much money you're receiving uh, from these gifts. Uh, they're exempt from the limit. Um, and the interesting thing is, I'll give you a quick example of how the limit plays out. You go to a conference, I went to a conference a couple of years ago, and there was a, a school leader uh, who won the raffle prize. And what he won was two tickets to a ba basketball game and a new iPad. And he was retiring that year. Uh, and he won the gifts and he came up to me and he said, uh, Wayne, this is worth about $800. I think I can't take it because of the limit. And I actually agreed with him. I said, yeah, that's a gift and you, you can't take it. You can only take it with 500, so maybe just take the basketball tickets or just take uh, the iPad. Well, he was retiring and he really wanted both because his son loved basketball and he wanted the iPad. So the other option was uh, he paid back he wrote a check to the conference for $300 to bring the total down to 500, right? So it was 800, worth $800. He paid them $300. He got to have a $500 gift, and that was fine. So there's, there's ways that you can work it if you, you know, as long as you're following the rules, you're okay in those situations. But be careful of those kind of things. Um, that, that can come up once in a while. And if you have lunch <coughs> with someone who you're not close friends with or not a family member, do kind of keep in your mind, keep track of that. You know, if it's more than $50, you are supposed to report that, okay? Okay, that is quick, uh, short form uh, uh, conversation on the Brown Act on, on ethics. Happy to take questions, Dr. Benitez. Did you have some questions? You ready, Wayne? I'm ready. All right, so let's say, let's suppose three or more of us are at a meeting and it's school board related. And a question gets asked of the board: um, Can we respond if three or four, or three or more of us are at this meeting? It's not a board meeting, but it is a district-related uh, meeting. So, can you give me a, 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 a specific ex or like an example of like what that kind of meeting would be? I'll give you a very specific example. Great. Uh, special Education Community Advisory Committee meeting. Yeah. Uh, we're not coordinating with each other, but these are open meetings. Some of us go sometimes, others go other times. Yeah. Um, on on, on an imaginary occasion, three or more of us could be there. Um, black community uh, session for strategic planning. Sure. Uh, I believe all of us uh, yeah. were there. Uh, what are the considerations as to uh, speaking uh, at those meetings? And, and it's a, it, it could be a scenario where one of us says something at the meeting, but the four others are present there, but yeah. also a scenario where people know board members are there and they ask a question sure. uh, of us. Sure, so uh, the issue is, 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 are a majority of you conversing together about school item, mm -hmm. right? So if, let's say, you get up to speak at a school function uh, and other board members are there, you're speaking for yourself, you're fine. What you wouldn't want to do is say, Mr. Otto, do you agree with me? Right. That kind of thing. You don't want to have that kind of engagement. But you can, you can speak of... 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, could use a different example maybe. But uh, so, so that's where you want to be careful is you can have that. And you can also, you know, if, if people are talking to you, it's fine to have that conversation. I would suggest at meetings that aren't agendized. So, for instance, uh, like our, our, um, our meetings on strategic planning, I don't think they're, they're, they're noticed in a way of we're advertising them, but they're not agendized like what the Brown Act would require because they're not a meeting of the board, right? But let's say a majority of the board is there. I would recommend strongly that you just kind of the antisocial thing. You stay clear of each other. Don't sit it with each other at the same table and spread out uh, and just make sure not to have three of you together at any time talking about the subject matter. Just kind of keep separated out. But you each could speak publicly uh, your own opinion as long as you're not having uh, in, engaging with other board members. Understood. So I'm going to keep rolling because we are all engaged in community context. I think uh, accessible to our community members beyond our board meetings. Um, when we are meeting with community members, members of the public, I should say, and they are, they are meeting with more than three of us, uh, recommendations in terms of what kind of interaction we're having if we know that they're also talking to uh, other board members or that they've met with other board members. Yeah, if I understand you correctly, and, and correct me if I'm not. So, for instance, if, if you go to a, a community meeting, if there's a panel, uh, I'm going to advise you not to have a majority of the board on that panel, right? Because if, if three of you get on that panel and start talking about school business, that's concerning to me. I think that's a meeting, and I think that would be illegal. But if one of you is on the panel and the others are in the audience and not, again, not engaging, you're okay. Is there is is that not answer? exactly good? Good that you explained that, but that wasn't the scenario. So let me okay. again hypothetical. Yeah. Yes. Uh, something's coming up in a future agenda, and community members reach out to us and say, "Hey, we want to meet with you about this item." Or something's not coming up, and they meet with us and say, "Hey, we want you to put this item yeah. on the agenda," uh, and they're meeting with more than one of us. Yes, they they should not meet with more than two of you at a time. Mm -hmm. Right. And there should not be conversation of you saying, well, I've talked to another board. Even if you've only talked to one other board member, you don't want to be telling them anything about the other board member and what they thought. You keep to your own uh, opinions and not share other points of views, then you're OK. But you do not want to have a situation where uh, members of the public invite the whole board to a meeting and you all show up to talk about school business, that's going to be a Brown Act violation if it's not agendized and not noticed. So I'm going to keep rolling with it, Wayne. I'm going to even be more specific. Yeah. Be because yeah. these are scenarios that we have to take into account on what we are going to say to, to, to uh, community members that are meeting with us and how we're going to approach meeting. So I'm just going to be very direct. Um, an issue or concern is being expressed by multiple community members to majority of the board via email, via calls, via public comment, and they are requesting to follow up with us. So they say, you know, board member Benitez, uh, we want to meet with you about this particular issue. All right. And they've already met with two or more mm -hmm. board members about the same particular issue. And they're sort of gauging where we're at on that particular issue. Where, you know, what are our opinions? Um, it's a tricky field, right? Because they, they, they could come with a different approach, hypothetically, if they've already talked to this board member and this board member, and they're like, oh, we're going to see if we can get a third vote from Benitez here. They may not say this is what board member Miller told us, right. but they may <laughs> say things that took place in that conversation to gauge where I'm at. Uh, yes. Yes. And Daisy I, chaining, Wayne, is what we're talking yeah. about here. Right. Right. The, yeah. A couple of things. Members of the public obviously uh, can't violate the Brown Act. It's only the board Correct. that's going to violate the Brown Act. So they may say to you, well, we talked to Member Miller and he said this. That's their violation, not yours. Right. You're not saying that. They're saying that. So that's not a, a problem necessarily. But you do want to be careful that when they invite you that 
you're going to go as an independent member of the board, and I would recommend you don't want to have any other board member. I mean, it wouldn't be against the law to have one other board member with you, but I would recommend in those situations that you attend independently and by yourself. Okay. You want to, did you want to go somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, I, I want to make sure that it's very clear. So to be clear, if a community member has a conversation with us, a one-way conversation about an item, and has the same one-way conversation about an item with any other member of this board or every other member on this board, it is not in violation of the Brown Act. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. And actually, staff, I'll bring this up too. Let's say that three or four of you may want to talk to Dr. Baker about something that's on the agenda coming up you know, next Wednesday. You can do that one-on-one. -on -one, she can have a conversation with each one of you as long as she's not saying, oh, well, Member Miller said this, or he, right? As long as it's one-on-one -on -one and independent, yeah. you're fine. Same thing with the public. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Uh, if we need to address this at a different point, let me know. I think it's Political Reform Act related, uh, Wayne. And I know you said there was an, uh, a, a component of that that you weren't going to get to. So if it's that, just let me know. Uh, but um, I think something passed that took effect January 1st in terms of campaign contributions yes. that then we couldn't take action if uh, someone in the community had contributed to our campaign and that action was related to that entity or, or individual. Right, AB 1439. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, and that is uh, going to come up within the next year because it's a 12-month moratorium. Yep. So whoever is up for re-election in 20... 24, uh, you, you'll have to be careful of this. And I think I, we sent something to the board about it. There's a few glitches that I'll be curious how they figure these things out. Um, but yes, in general, if you've received a campaign donation within a year, you're not supposed to uh, vote on a contract or anything that involves that donor. Uh, now, a great question, I think, mm -hmm. is what if a union donates money to your campaign? What if uh, Southern California, you know, uh, uh, SoCal Power mm -hmm. uh, gives money to your campaign? Uh, these are some questions that I think have to be decided probably by the Fair Political Practices Commission in, in doing their regulations based on the law. And hopefully that will come out, you know, before it matters, I would yeah. hope sometime this year. Yeah. So there's some questions about it. But in general, the law is, is that if you receive a donation from an individual or a group you, that, that then comes in front of you for a vote, you are to recuse yourself. Yeah. I'll pause there because I want to allow uh, some time for my, comp for my colleagues to chat in. Uh, to piggyback on Dr. Benitez's comments, is that a person and or a person who represents that organization, or is it literally just the organization? It, so, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's either, it, in the law, it says either individual or organization, is what it says. Yeah. Is there a limit to that donation? That's a great question. I'm not positive of the answer of that. Uh, I, I don't believe there is, but let me check on that, and I'll get back to you for sure. Got real quiet up here all of a sudden. <laughs> if there are, are there Mr. other Miller? questions? No. Um, would you would you say it would be the best practice for a board member to have a personal policy of not accepting gifts as a general rule? I think it's a good rule. It, it's not it's not legal. Right, it goes beyond what is legal. It's you're you're being very careful. But I will will say, in my years when I worked for the state government, uh, and I had to fill out a form 700, and I worked directly for governor or whatever position I was in, I I never I always bought my own lunch. I I, I was teased by some of my friends, but I said, you know what, I I don't I just don't want to re have to think about reporting it. I, and, and I would have lobbyists sometimes who try to take me to lunch and be like, I'm going to pay my own lunch. So I do think it's a good practice, um, and that way you avoid any worry about what you have to report on your Form 700. Um, so it's, it's a good, I think it's a good practice. It's not necessary, 
uh, it's not necessarily you, you, that you have to do it, uh, but I think it's a, it's a good practice. Okay. So, so I'm curious, uh, in Los Angeles for the school board elections in 2018, I believe for two seats they raised $27 million. How do you do that if you don't accept gifts? Well, campaign donations are different than gifts. Yeah, campaign donations are separate from gifts under the law. Um, so we're talking uh, outside of the campaign realm. Okay. for gifts yeah we're talking about lunches we're talking about gifts where this comes up sometimes is is over holidays <clears throat> you know a, a vendor might provide each one of you uh you know sixty dollars and sees candy which unfortunately isn't as much you know is, isn't that much anymore uh as i as i learned at christmas time this year uh but you know if you receive you a couple boxes yeah, right, right yeah right for fifty dollars you only get like two pounds now but the, the, you know, if you get more than $50 worth of seized candy from a vendor, you are expected to report that. That would be reported. It doesn't mean you can't vote on the vendor's contract. It just means you have to report that gift. So it comes up once in a while. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I think um, Ms. Lopez's question made me think of, uh, I, I believe only uh, community college and school districts don't have campaign contribution limits, uh, right? So special you, districts yeah, don't if, either, if unless you they create. You can follow them. up on that yeah. um, it, to, to see if there are either different criteria or exceptional circumstances when there are no con campaign contribution limits. But now I'm thinking I don't want to go too much into the weeds here, but I think this is the time to have these yeah. conversations, especially for community members, all 2.2 million of them, uh, Mr. <laughs> Miller, that are watching tonight. Um, from time to time, in our board capacity, we get invited to do, you know, speaking engagements, uh, to visit some of our um, partner institutions, thinking about Long Beach City College, and oftentimes uh, parking is covered. Sure. So, is that because... So speak to, speak to that. Uh, yes, Wayne. as I mentioned earlier, this is complicated, yeah. right? There are so many different exceptions and so many different rules. Yeah. But in that situation, if you're going to speak, uh, they can provide you parking, they can provide you a small honorarium, and they can provide you dinner. That's okay. okay. Don't have to report that. Okay, it's an exception, right? So, it, but if you're just going to the conference. Uh, and uh, you're lavished with gifts, that may be something different, yeah. right? But uh, honorariums and actually doing something at the event, yeah. you're covered. You don't have to worry about that. All right. Steak dinners and lobster and stuff at LBCC are good. I feel like I've been missing out. <laughs> you're, you're referencing all these things. I've, I, I don't know how I've been missing out. Well, on Dan, at some point, this may have been pre-pandemic, I think that we received like a parking pass from LBCC, so, something. Uh, yeah, so, so, so that kind of stuff. Well, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because um, we have been giving, given, a, I guess this is okay to mention it. Um, Be careful what you say, Dan. Yeah. I know. <laughs> let's say we were given a parking <laughs> pass. Yeah. Like, let's say it said, you know, LBCC staff, and that's good for a year, a school year. For, for to do what? For, it's a parking to pass. To park there. And it's worth more than fifty dollars. Oh, I don't know the I don't Probably know the value so. of it. Probably. Yeah, Doug it, knows. Let's assume let's assume it's over fifty dollars because if it's less than fifty dollars, you don't have to report it. It's only if it's over fifty dollars you have to report it. So let's say it's over fifty dollars. If it's just given to you and they don't expect anything of you or you want to take a class there and they're doing it out of their kindness of their own heart, I think you'd have to report that. If they're giving it to you because you're going to attend functions yeah. right. as a board member, yeah. then that's an honorarium and yeah. it would not have that's to be honorary. reported. Yeah. Yeah. The expectation okay. is that as board members, we would be going to things on that, cam on that campus yes. in our capacity as board members. Yes, that would be excluded. Then you wouldn't yeah. have to report that gift. You're sweating a little bit there, Madam Chair. 
Well, well, a nice thing too I want to mention is the Fair Political Practices Commission is great with amendments. And I've seen this many times. You fill out your Form 700, <coughs> excuse me, and all of a sudden in August you realize, oh my gosh, I forgot to, last year I did this, uh, some kind of employment for $700 and I totally forgot to put it on my form 700 or I received a gift and I didn't I forgot about it or whatever it is you forgot all you do is submit a new form 700 put amended on the front date at the day that you're doing it and turn it in and they will not prosecute you they will not fine you there they encourage you to do that um, so if tonight, for some reason, you realize, oh my gosh, I didn't include my spouse's income in last year's Form 700, <coughs> don't worry, you're not going to jail, you're not getting fined, uh, but I would suggest that you uh, fill an amended form out and do it and, and make the correction and you're fine. Sorry, uh, Leticia, when, do we, when does that come in, the Form 700? Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, you usually you you usually will get uh, uh, it sometime in early March, and it's due April first. I think during the pandemic they pushed it a couple months, but it's due April first. Yeah. Okay. So, do we have any other questions, Mr. Otto? You're confusing me with the <laughs> light being on. Well, I have a lot of questions, but I'm not going to ask them. Okay. Um, so. Does that conclude your report that, for that us? That concludes my report. And if you do have any questions and you want to chat with me, feel free to give me a call or one-on-one. Uh, on one. Yeah, yeah, one-on-one. On one. One on not one. as not as a majority, and yeah, I'd be happy to majority. talk to you. Yeah, we could go to lunch, but I'm going to buy my own. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I think these kind of uh, conversations are are necessary, especially to have them in a public setting. Okay, that was staff report. Uh, New business. Okay, and this is going to be, we need a vote on the uh, amended bargaining proposals from the California School Employees Association, that's CSEA Chapter 2, Unit A, and Unit B to the Long Beach Unified School District. Move approval. It's an action item. Mm -hmm. It's an action item, yes. You need a second. I need a second. What's the motion? What's, what's the motion? The, the motion is to adopt the amended bargaining proposals from CSEA Chapter 2, Unit A, and Unit B. Second. OK. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes 5-0. Uh, OK. Report of board members. Uh, and you can include announcements. And we'll start with Mr. Miller. Thank you, President Craighead. Uh, well, I don't have much. I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the hard work of the staff and everyone who put on the event that happened at Jordan High School. No, I'm sorry, not at Jordan High School, uh, at uh, Doris Topsy Elvord, yeah, Houghton Park, essentially, um, for the Black Community Visioning uh, event. It was a huge, huge success, uh, in my opinion, as there were 70 plus uh, folks in the room. Yeah, no, it was a, a really grand turnout. Um, but more importantly, I watched. I did not comment, Dr. I mean, Mr. Shrumford. I had nothing to say. Um, I watched a lot of the uh, comments that were giving and said, uh, all things considered, uh, I was humbled at um, the level of interest that was in that space. Uh, I've shared once before. Uh, as uh, a representative of the African-American community. Obviously, I'm not speaking for all black people, but I will speak for um, just some of the personal sentiments that I have when it comes to uh, previous systems and having an impact on those systems. Uh, there are folks that think like me and recognize that there's a level of distrust. Uh, all things considered, I was pretty impressed with the folks that were in that space who were still willing to 
fight through that previous distrust that the black community has had with systems to make sure that they had their um, voice heard. Um, and uh, it was clear that the black community in particular is very much invested in the success of the Long Beach Unified School District. And so I know that that opportunity was created by a number of folks, but I just wanted to recognize those that helped put on the event, uh, especially a lot of folks that are in this room, because I thought that it was done very, very well. Uh, that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Benitez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, it was great to be there, uh, Mr. Miller. And actually, Wayne just told us we could talk at these meetings. We just can't talk to each other. Uh, After Wayne's report, I have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, great, great event. Uh, and, I, and I think just the space of networking, interacting, uh, folks checking in with each other that maybe they hadn't seen in a while uh, was, was a good vibe uh, overall there. So I want to give uh, props to uh, Whittier Elementary School. They actually hosted uh, two events at once. What do we say? We say we feed two birds with one seed and had a community building event um, while we also had our um, community feedback loop for our strategic planning uh, session. So we had that going on in the cafeteria at the same time that there was all kinds of fun community building stuff going on there. And I know that um, Principal Jesperson and his staff have committed to doing these monthly uh, there. So I also want to give uh, props to our level head office, Mr. Moskovitz, for not just uh, supporting uh, these events at the elementary school level, but encouraging and nudging and doing what we got to do to just remind principals, hey, if we're going to do community engagement, it really starts uh, with the culture of our school communities. And I, I think events like this uh, in the long haul develop that trust, rebuild trust. And quite frankly, it's fun. Uh, right there's a DJ out there, music, fun. So we can do multiple things at the same time. And so we had a captive audience there that literally could just walk into the cafeteria, and we had um, our strategic planning team there as well. So so the lunar new. I was just gonna get there, right? So it it it's one of those things that community it, it, on on our end. It's actually very little that we need to do, all right? Because it is built on our community partners being involved in, Lunar New in an event like Lunar New Year, right? So uh, I, I was saving the special sort of thank you to, it doesn't happen or it becomes very difficult to happen without the involvement of our allies and our community partners because they really did, I mean, f everything from canvassing to phone calls uh, to uh, sort of just, you know, um, leveraging the assets and gifts and talents that we already have in the community. So special shout out to all of the community partners that bring these things as allies to our school board, and then we can fulfill our commitment to engage with our community. So uh, really cool. Uh, and, and again, it's going on across our district at multiple school sites, but I think Whittier um, has committed to doing one of these every month. Um, I also wanted to share that I think at the last board meeting I mentioned that I was going to start up again with my community uh, office hours. I uh, got a chance to check in with Dr. Kale today because one of the community members that I met with um, brought uh, it was actually um, provided some public comments at a previous school board meeting around our seal of biliteracy. So I just want to acknowledge a follow up conversation with Dr. Kale and her team. Um, around sort of what we're doing around languages, dual immersion. We had the presentation and our emerging bilinguals across uh, the district. So uh, good conversations. Again, I'm partnering with our local community partners to co-host uh, one to two of these a month where we provide some district updates and then we take questions and then we connect them to our school site staff and, and or bring back stuff to our uh, school board meeting. So thank you to the community members that showed up uh, to that. And um, I think that's my report for tonight. Thank you. Mr. Otto. I will be brief. I, I, the event that I want to uh, <clears throat> mention or celebrate is the, actually it was two events at the same place. It was at Dooley uh, Elementary School uh, uh, where there simultaneously was a kind of back to school uh, event for uh, people in the community who were 
and I got there to participate in that. And when I say participate, I mean walk around. But uh, you know, the, the they had the library was open, and people were looking at the how the library worked, and it was uh, was very exciting. But but uh, also, and not at exactly the same time, a little later was the um, was the strategic plan uh, outreach to the community, and I was very impressed with uh, the way that they did it and the amount of interest that was shown by the community and the strategic plan. I, Dr. Benitez and I have ongoing conversations about community outreach and what works and what doesn't work, and, and we don't know. And you know, we, we did that community visioning um, a few months ago that we weren't completely happy with, but here people just seem to be interested in the strategic plan. It was well run by our consultants and who got people to uh, look at the different uh, uh, different stations that they had set up, and so it was uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I had absolutely no conversations with anyone because I was in anticipation of Wayne's presentation tonight, and I wasn't sure. But uh, uh, but uh, but it was it was a, a great event in that part of town. I was glad to have participated. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Yes, yeah, so I too had the opportunity to um, to visit uh, Dooley, and uh, the Kinder Festival was just great. So kudos to all of you who uh, made that event possible. It was a great, great opportunity for the community to learn about the enrollment process and really meet some wonderful LBUSD staff. Um, I also had the opportunity to visit Jordan, meet with the administration there, and get a tour of this beautiful facility. Um, I learned about their pathways and just very, very impressed with all of the wonderful work taking place there at, um, at Jordan. And um, just before we end, I just want to acknowledge the pain and suffering of the two families um, uh, who lost uh, their child to a tragic uh, incident. So just uh, the family, friends, and uh, educators who uh, were connected with those two students. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. Um, let's see. First, I want to congratulate the Lakewood NJR, NJROTC. They placed first overall at the Murrieta High School drill meet this last weekend, and there were 15 other schools, and now they qualify for the Area 11, um, and that's a uh, Championship, and that's uh, Southern California and Arizona, and that's happening next month. They not only placed first overall, but they placed second in drill overall and first place in athletics overall. And there were many more, um, many more accolades for their event. So, congratulations to them. Um, also, today marks the beginning of Black History Month. And being February 1st, it's also Freedom Day, and that's uh, commemorating the signing of the um, 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in 1865. And I want to remind people that next week, oh dear, I have too many papers. Um, next week is the um, band and orcas, here it is the all district band and orchestra concert and that's tuesday february 7th at seven o'clock at jordan so that should be very enjoyable and then also vision 2035 we've talked a little bit uh, tonight about strategic plan the strategic planning initiative um, it's in its second phase and we've gathered in input from the community and now we're asking uh, for our community members to take a look, see what we got right, see what maybe we have missed, and so please check online. We have a survey that's available and that will really uh, help us out. So now we'll go to superintendent's report, Dr. Baker. Me. Can, I, can I say one other thing that I, that yes. I forgot to say, and I'm, I can't believe I forgot it. Uh, last Saturday I attended the memorial service for uh, Keith Hansen. At, uh, at Wilson High School, and uh, uh, the auditorium was packed. And uh, 
I've known Keith for a long time, and he's such a story and such a representative of uh, the Long Beach Unified School District. And uh, 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 lots of people spoke. In fact, I think three of the seven or eight people who spoke said we were all instructed that we could speak for no longer than five to seven minutes at the outside, and not a single person adhere to that rule. Everybody spoke for over 10 minutes, and uh, it lasted about two hours, and afterwards, the, the, the Bruinettes and the, and the band, the drum corps, uh, took everybody out to the quad, and uh, it was a great event, a great celebration for Long Beach Unified, so I would like to adjourn in, in his memory tonight. Okay, Dr. Baker. Thank you. I'm going to continue just the celebrations with a few school shout outs and a couple other things. And I'm going to call Mr. Zaid. He'll close my report tonight. So the first thing is I want to celebrate Milliken's Marching Band, who in an article recently were credited with making historic strides. So um, the past eight years under director Rudolph Picanco has marked a steady improvement for Millican High School Marching Band, and the Rams have been able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. The article goes on to describe that the Millican Band placed third in their um, divisions of the Regional California State Band Championship la late last year, and then they placed fifth in state competition. Both accomplishments are first in Millican history, so really wonderful to see our Millican Marching Band make historic strides. And then secondly, off to Wilson. We have a group of students who have won a Student Television Network 2022 Fall Nationals competition. That is Ben Tinsley, Mateos Mondalia, Mia Arena, Kai Stop, and Ernesto Felix. They work together to make a, a short film, a drama called Rebirth. Um, Rebirth is a story of a friendship initiation gone wrong at Long Beach's Colorado Lagoon. The tenth story works well at night considering the excellent use of lighting and sound, it was stated. And I want to also acknowledge Mr. Hang, their teacher. He said, I'm a proud teacher and happy to be a part of finding avenues they can become successful in, and the rest is really just the kids, often what our teachers say, even they don't take credit for themselves. He said, I taught them the foundations and the rest is their work. So congratulations to the students at Wilson as well. We had a number of students that attended the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Fair in Los Angeles last weekend. Um, dozens of them actually receiving scholarships and offers on the spot at that fair. And so Dr. Camarino was there with the team, um, both from his office and from a number of our schools who were there to uplift students, to encourage them, and to help them participate. And literally, they walked away with scholarships to well-known HBCUs. So just a wonderful opportunity for our students as we expand our connection to the HBCUs very strategically with a teacher on special assignment that makes connection with our college and career centers at every high school and is continuing to expand the way that we interact with our HBCU. So I'd like to thank Mayor Richardson. We had our first mayoral visit last week. It worked out for us because it was finals week, um, wanted to not disrupt a school and Sato had already gone through finals. And so we spent a couple of hours there and uh, Mayor Richardson had a wonderful time with students. Um, I, I actually didn't think he was going to leave at some point. He asked great questions. He listened to students talk about how their voice is incorporated into decisions that are made at the school. And then he got into all kinds of aeronautics, robotics, technology, um, and was just filled re really with inspiration by what our students shared with him. So it was a great, great visit there. And um, President Craighead, you've already mentioned Black History Month. Well, we don't want months of the year to be the only time that we celebrate culture. We are a district that celebrates every month and the culture of all of our students. And this is Black History Month. So we are collecting, I guess a shout out to our schools, we're collecting information about events so that we can be out and about, so that you can be out and about this month. There are lots of things going on around the district to celebrate um, our black community. And so with that, I will pass to Mr. Zaid for a last and a very important announcement. Uh, Dr. Picker. Could we comment on the Middle School Choice Fair Saturday? Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Lund. So on Saturday, we're hosting our Middle School Choice Fair, um, showcasing all of our middle and K-8 schools for our upcoming, uh, well, our current fifth grade students in selecting their middle school for next year. 
Where is that? That's at Browning High School (laughs) uh, from 9 to 12. And I would just simply like to announce that we are hiring. Um, We are having our teacher and administrator recruitment night on Thursday, February 16th. There is an invitation for um, not only new teachers, but our experienced teachers to come on out. We are hiring for a variety of different positions. And I will just say that our flyer says it all. It says that we're seeking diverse candidates who are dedicated to continuous improvement, caring student relationships, and an unwavering commitment to equity. So if you are an excellence and equity champion, Long Beach is looking for you. And we wanna invite you to join this team. Um, You can RSVP on our website. And I would like to thank our communications team for all the branding work and beautiful design um, to just a attract candidates to our district but we look forward to seeing everyone on february 16th and if you are a parent if you're a student if you are someone who knows someone who you can bring over to long beach please invite them to our recruitment night Um, it is not only going to be a presentation but it will be face-to-face interactions so all of our teams will be there Um, from our student support services to OCIPD to our level offices. We'll be talking curriculums. We'll have salary and benefits there. We'll be able to uh, talk about our dual immersion programs and all the different ways that Long Beach is making a difference in the community. So please, please, please invite someone, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Mr. Zaid. Um, Mr. Miller, I understand you neglected to mention an announcement. I did, and it's an important one, so I felt the need to take 30 more seconds. The Black History Celebration at Jordan High School is going down on February 23rd. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. So um, our good friend, Miss uh, Alyssa uh, Taylor Stewart, I don't want to mess up uh, her last name, is working with our Black Student Achievement and putting on this year's event. It's from 6 to 8. Um, I'm looking forward to it, you know. You can register online at lbusd.com backslash black excellence, if I'm not mistaken. No, yes. And it is titled, It's the Black Excellence for Me. So I'm pretty excited about uh, this year's event. So I just wanted to make sure I shared it. It's going to have some student performers. I'm hoping it's the singing group from Wilson. Okay. All right. (laughs) Yes. All right. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Um, Well, I'd also like to close tonight's meeting for our Lakewood student um, who was tragically killed. Um, His name is Khalil Salim. And... Um, He was our uh, student who was the victim of gun violence, and so I'd like to also close our meeting in in honor of him. Um, But this does include the uh, meeting for tonight, and so I thank you all for sticking with us, and I declare the meeting adjourned. (laughs) 